All right, so we're going to continue our, uh, I guess, our class from earlier today. This is great. So it, we may struggle on our slides a little bit because there's an entire globe there in all that dark space. So I don't know if it's like dark matter or what, but something's going on <laughs> with this projector. Anyways, how many of you guys accept international payments today? Yeah, look at around. We're so myopic in the U.S., except for my man Mark there from WorldPay, of course. And anybody take alternative payments yet? Any kind of alternative payments? Ah, shocking. Okay. So this is great. And the reason why is if you're not taking them yet, this is the reason why you will be taking them soon. And the reason why the rest of the world is chasing international payments. This is Forrester Research showing e-com today. And as you can see in the U.S. and Europe, pretty much getting to a saturation point where growth has slowed. So the top line numbers are still the largest, but the growth numbers are definitely the smallest. So today, e-com between US and Western Europe is hovering somewhere between 10 and 15%. Where the real growth is, is in markets like APAC and especially Latin America. So their top line number down in Latin America, not as high as in North America, but the growth rate is triple what we have here in the US. So clipping around at about 30%. We expect it to be at 30% for the next three to five years. So definitely something you want to be cognizant of. And when you look at APAC, the top line number is actually larger than it is here in Northern America. So definitely a market you want to be in. And even if you don't plan to be in that market, you want to support alternative payments because the number one traveling citizen, does everybody know who that is as far as expenditures go? It's a Chinese citizen. And on average, they spend $10,000 every time they come over here from China. But they don't have Visa, they don't have American Express, they don't have MasterCard. What they have is they have Alipay, and they're using that. Earlier we were talking about WeChat. Um, they have a payment product within WeChat. And if you don't support that, you're not going to get that customer. But that's the reason why those companies have established city offices in San Francisco to really work with ISVs and acquirers to support those payment types because they want their citizens to have that same great consumer experience that they have in China when they travel over here to the US. To give you one more stat, on average, a Chinese national spends $50,000 a year when they travel, which is shocking, right? The reason they do that is China caps their external expenditures at $50,000. So what happens many times is when you have an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a friend that comes over here, you give them a bunch of money to buy you stuff here in the States because it's a lot cheaper than doing it in China. So that's how they get to the $50,000. That's a customer we all want because that guy, he's spending money and he's got money to spend. So definitely remember you know, the Alipays and the WeChats, the 10 pays of the world. Now, when you look to expand globally, this is usually the reason why us in America haven't done this. Our market's fairly large already, so we usually think that's good enough. <clears throat> but actually, it's not because the, the growth is slowing, as we've seen. What makes it complicated is if we look at this chart right here, that's an acquire or a merchant on the left-hand side in the orange. And what's required of them to implement a payment within a mobile device or on an e-com site is usually to do an API integration to an acquirer. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's what we call dumb pipes, because if you think about the payload, is every, everyone in here, do we have some developers? Or you guys know like API integrations and things like that? Okay. So a, a payload when you're doing coding is usually charges, credit card, you know, parentheses, and then you have a few pieces of information or parameters that you're passing. Uh, a limited payload is a credit card number, an expiration date, CVV code, and the charge amount. That's what's being passed up to the acquirer. What's being passed back down is even more sparse. It's normally approved or declined, and then a code. And that's all the information that goes back and forth. So when you're doing that one-to-one, -one, if you want to expand into the next country, you have to do that again for an acquirer over there, or you want to add an alternative payment type, you have to do that R&D effort again. Or you want to add a fraud detection engine, you have to do that integration all over again. So you can see it becomes very cumbersome. And to put that into perspective, there is a large gaming company down in Orange County that started to expand globally, and they have 27 processors that they deal with. So they're in you know, 27 different countries, they have 27 different processors. So they went through this iteration over and over again 27 times. 
Um, and then they realized, hey, we're not a payments company. How come you know, our staff of payments IT people equal 50, you know, 50 heads? And they decided to look for something else out there that was going to help them expand globally and not have to become a payments expert. Now, one of the things that you're going to do when you expand into other countries that you'll realize real quick is that there is no single acquirer in the world today that will give you global coverage. Just doesn't exist, like nada. The reason why we know that is I'm gonna share with you some data that we pull out of our smart router. Um, so our smart router is connected internationally to about 50 different processors and acquirers, so we have a lot of data um, that like each one of them don't necessarily have because they only have their data set but we have everyone so we can compare you know, the performance of one guy against another. And what we're looking at here is this is a popular travel website that a lot of people use. And what they discovered is, hey, our decline rates are over 30%. So in the left-hand side of the graph there, that is by month, that's showing how many orders are going through. In green are the successful orders, in red are the declines, or what we call the false declines. So what this travel company realized is, even though they're in Europe, over 50% of their customers are US-based. Because us Americans always figure out where the best price is, right? So we figured out it's cheaper for us to buy an airline ticket on this European website than it is for us to buy it on a Travelocity or an Expedia here in the States. So they're getting lots of us buying our tickets over there. What happens, though, is because they're using a European-based acquirer, that European-based acquirer sees an online transaction coming from the United States, so they decline the transaction because they think it's fraudulent. So what these guys have done is they've tried to shore that up by adding additional acquirers. On the top one, on the right-hand side, that's a company by the name of B2Bill, so they offer some alternative payment types in addition to Visa and MasterCard. The second one is Credirex, then Wirecard, and the last one is WorldPay. The thinking behind this was, they were only with Wirecard in the beginning. And I don't know if everybody read this story, but a couple months ago, Wirecard had an outage for about 18 hours. So no business for 18 hours. If you're trying to get an Uber and Wirecard was your acquirer, <laughs> you weren't getting an Uber for 18 hours. You weren't taking web orders, you know, on and on and on. So they tried to shore that up by adding Credirex as a secondary backup. And then they allow the smart router to detect if an acquirer is down or slow. And if it is, it just automatically reroutes the transaction to the backup. So it gives you like real fault tolerance. What they did in the US to shore up the US declines is they added WorldPay, because WorldPay is a domestic acquirer for the United States. And that brought their declines down from about 32% to about 8%. So you're still going to have declines for various reasons, but you won't get those false declines any longer because you're actually processing in state. Now, when you're looking to expand globally, there's really three things that you want to keep in mind that you're going to need. So the first one's connectivity to these backends, to these acquirers. The second one is fraud management. So we don't see that a lot here in the US, but as soon as you get into Latin America, um, Eastern Europe, you know, Russia, places like that. Uh, you're going to see a lot of fraud all of a sudden. It just goes up. So you definitely want to have those fraud engines invoked. And then the third thing is, what is our third thing? Ah, alternative payment types. So even though you have connectivity to a particular country, if you don't support the payment types that they use and you're only supporting Visa and MasterCard, you're not going to have a lot of success there. So to put that in perspective, let's say you wanted to expand into China. Well, China, less than 5% of the people have a Visa and MasterCard. So unless you support these alternative types that we're talking about, like the Alipays of the world, not going to have a lot of success there. Even going into places like Western Europe, so you, you would think Western Europe's like the United States, but do you know, does anybody know what the number one payment type in Germany is? Yeah, yeah. Bank account transfer, that's right. <laughs> number two, PayPal. Number three, way, way, way down on the list, Visa and MasterCard. So even going into an easy region like that um, becomes difficult all of a sudden. When you get into the Netherlands, you have supported a thing called Klarna. Get into Russia, it's Yandex. Um, down in Brazil, it's Bolado. Mexico, it's OXO. The list goes on and on and on. So it gets pretty complex. And in fact, it looks like this. <clears throat> if you wanted to have comprehensive global coverage, 
this is what you're dealing with. Each one of those are an individual contract. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have all six of the acquirers in the United States jacked in, but most likely you want two or three. When you go over to Europe, the same thing, you want a couple there, you want a couple in Asia, you want a couple down in Central America, and a couple more down in South America. And the reason for that is, again, they're gonna have specific alternative payment types that they're using, but you wanna make sure that you're not getting those false positives that are happening down there. So to give you another example, if you are using a Chase debit card and you go to Mexico, that card will never work down there. 100% of those cards get declined. Tons of people use Chase debit cards that are rented Visa, and they would never believe that in a million years till they go to Mexico. Um, is everyone familiar with OXO? OXO, okay, so OXO is a chit type of system. It's a 7-Eleven types of stores down in Mexico, so if you want to buy something online, you usually go to OXO store, give them your cash, they give you a chit with a number on it, and then you put that number in on the website. So again, just an alternative you know, payment type that they're using down there versus a Visa MasterCard. To put this into an example, let's say I am buying a Louis Vuitton purse for my wife on a trip that I've made to China. If you're using a smart router, the smart router should be able to take care of that transaction for you and you walk out happily with your purse. If you're not using a smart router and you only have a single acquirer and you happen to be a US based company, what's gonna happen is this, is I'm in China, the Chinese retailer processes my transaction and he's using, let's say in this case, Tesis as his processor. He would tell that guy, okay, it's, you can take Visa and MasterCard and I happen to have a Visa card, so I give it to him. That transaction would actually come all across the world back to the US to be processed on-prem here in the States. And what would most likely happen is Tesis would reject that transaction because it's happening in China, right? They would think there's a high instance of fraud there. If you're using a smart router, what would happen with that transaction is the transaction would come in and the smart router would use geolocation and figure out, hey, you're in China, and they would route it to a local Chinese acquirer. Transaction goes through, you avoid all the cross-border fees that would have happened if you used a, a US domestic acquirer, and I get to walk out of the store with the Louis Vuitton purse. So in our minds, that's how we all think these transactions should work, but in fact, they don't work because, again, we're very myopic here in the US, and we're trying to plug a, a square peg into a round hole when it comes into the rest of the world. And I'm gonna show you a couple of things that help shore this up as far as technology goes. Um, anyone using fraud engines today on your mobile or e-com sites? Uh, see, in the US, US, we don't see a lot of fraud unless it comes externally. But if you were to go to Mexico, uh, Mexico Visa allows three, up to 3% fraud, which doesn't sound like a lot. But in the US and Europe, it's 1%. And you don't want to have to eat 3% of the fraud you know, that's coming through your systems today. So it's not necessarily a good thing, but that just puts it into perspective as far as how much fraud's going on down in Mexico. And I was just telling somebody the story. My wife and I just came back from a diving trip in Cozumel, and we were doing a, a parasail thing. And we were paying by credit card, but the boat didn't have it. So you had to circle back around and pulled up on the beach with um, the guy that had the credit card machine. The guy literally walked it to the boat, swiped her ENV card, and then we went and did our thing. When we got back to our hotel, we had the text messages asking us if we had you know, purchased something for $400 in New York. Like That's how fast that stuff happens and how prevalent it is. So you'll definitely encounter that as you expand out. Okay, so how do we make that complex ecosystem a lot simpler? And what you're starting to see now is disruptive technology that's coming on the market that is democratizing payments for merchants again. So in this instance here, if you think back from the dumb pipe days, which is where we are today in most instances, so it's that one-to-one -one relationship, what's happening, what new technology is, it's acting as an aggregator out there. So this piece of tech, which is the company I work for called Zeus, it sits up in at the cloud on AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services. And what it does is it acts as an aggregator to all of this complexity right here. So it has all the acquirers built in, all the different prod engines, and all the alternative payment types through one single API. And Zeus isn't the only company doing that. 
you know, just happen to be the best. But yeah, there are a few companies that are coming on the market now where you're starting to see this type of uh, activity happen. Now, what's nice about this is as a merchant, an app developer, a web developer, you know, big international e-com guy, you don't have to do those one-to-one -one integrations any longer. You do one simple RESTful API integration to the smart payments router, and then it gives you all the connectivity, all the fraud engines, and all the alternative payment types. So as new alternative payment types come out, now people want to use Android Pay and the Samsung Pay, you know, Pepsi Pay, whatever. You don't have to worry about those because those are built into the router automatically. So what it does for you is it really reduces your R&D footprint to accept any type of payments that the customer wants to use. Right? And that's really the goal here because it seems like you know, we're always talking about these mobile payments at the show, but then when you look and see what the acquirers have actually implemented, usually not a lot. I think the only one I've really seen out there today is Apple Pay in an NFC configuration. You still don't see it a lot on a website or within a mobile app. Or anyone use uh, Hotels Tonight or Uber? Uber? Yeah, you use Apple Pay and Uber, anyone? Yeah, I mean, that's the way it should work, right? So they solved uh, the problem of putting in your name, address, phone number, all that information on your little mobile device, because now it's just you're clicking your Apple Pay button or holding down your thumb, and it's done for you. In this case here, so let's use this as an example real quick. I am a app developer. I connect to this API. And that first piece of this API is what we call a, a payment smart router. So no longer is it just a subset of a small little payload of information. We're collecting everything about that payment. It could be product information, it could be geolocation, it could be device fingerprint if you're using a mobile device. And then you can use any of that information to route that payment. So in this instance here, what's going on is as the request comes in, it figures out, where are you? Chester's in China. So now it connects us to a Chinese acquirer. But maybe before we go to Chinese acquirer, we decide we want to run this against a fraud engine because we're seeing a lot of fraud out there and we don't want to be liable for it. So we have a you know one out of nine different fraud engines we can bounce this transaction against. And then the other thing we may want to do, again, up in the cloud because this is an extraction layer, is tokenize that transaction. So then that way I can make sure there's not going to be anyone that's going to try to you know, hack this and steal my information. We can create an Omni token that you can use amongst multiple acquirers. And then once that's all done, it returns the result back to us. The customer's processed. We're done and good to go. So very, very different than the way that people integrate today to acquirers, because usually they're coming into, I, I call it purpose-built technology. So it's usually um, legacy tech that is purpose-built to get the acquiring account versus if you just use a technology stack that's not concerned with the acquiring. Um, you know, it's in the right place. They're not making you know, the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons. It's just technology, pure and simple. So it helps you, again, take back the control as a merchant as far as your merchant account. A couple other examples of this, which is great, is if, if you think this through, because really what this does is it sets up an arbitrage situation for you. Um, today, the way it looks is you'll usually create or establish a merchant account with one processor and then use that contract to negotiate a better deal with the secondary processor, right? That's kind of the game merchants are in all the time. With this, what we're actually saying is, you shouldn't do that any longer. You should have multiple merchant accounts. And the way that we're democratizing it is saying, hey, smart router, you figure out what's the best route for this transaction. It could be best based on highest acceptance, could be based on lowest rates. It all depends. There's different variables involved. But now all of a sudden, I don't have to pit this guy against that guy. The guy that's serv servicing me the best is the, the person that's going to get the transaction. So it kind of changes everything, right? The other way we see larger companies using this is they split, um, they do A-B split testing, one guy against another. So maybe you'll figure out that one guy's charging you different rates for certain MCC codes because maybe their system is jacked up. And then you just tell the smart router to send those MCC codes over to this guy that charges you less. Or this guy um, has downtime. So rather than you being down, it simply routes it to processor A. And then that way you don't experience any downtime at all. So pretty revolutionary stuff that hasn't existed in the industry before, but we expect to see um, a lot more of this. Now this is a chart on one of our dashboards, just to kind of explain uh, the way 
that routing works. So what's happening is this is a real-time chart that's you know kind of waving and changing as we go along. But as we come into this, the Zeus API, the first thing that it does is it hits this Forder fraud prevention engine and it figures out, is this a fraudulent transaction, yes or no? In this case, what he's doing is this customer is putting 75% of their transactions on Chase and 25% down on Vantive. So he's splitting them and then he's gonna A-B you know, test against which one's giving me better results. The third instance here is WorldPay. So as a transaction comes in, if he figures out the bin number on that card is a European card, he just auto routes it over to WorldPay in Europe automatically. And this is all happening dynamically. Um, a couple other things to point out here, you'll see with the API, there are certain transactions that just go straight through. So there was a router rule that was set up for that that says, hey, if this is an employee cell or repeat customer, um, a low transaction volume, he's just gonna pass it through where he doesn't have to hit that fraud engine because every time he hits the fraud engine, he's being charged a fee for that. And then down here in red, these are transactions that just fall out because CVV code's wrong, expiration dates expired, things like that. So that happens automatically for you as well. So all kinds of different ways for you to, to save money and make sure that your acceptance rates go up now. Um, that really didn't exist before. So pr pretty exciting stuff as far as technology goes. This is a case story for Get. Has anybody ever used Get, Get Taxi? If you're from, wow, I really have you like US people here. So Get is like Uber overseas. And their problem was they're an app developer, same thing, they wanted to expand into other countries and they kept running into declines all the time. And then they realized that, hey, we needed to get processors for those specific regions. And then rather than going out and doing that development themselves, what they did is they hooked up with this extraction layer and it gave them all that connectivity, all the alternative payment types. And same thing happened. They went from 35% decline rates down to about 8%. So it worked very, very well for them. And if anybody's from New York, you'll see the taxis now, you can help them with this Get Taxi app. So an application that started up in Russia, and Europe and Israel, and now they're in uh, New York. But they, these guys probably do about 75, 100,000 rides per day. And again, rather than dealing with all of that payment complexity, they just run it through this extraction layer. It's worked very, very well for them. Okay, so to summarize this, I would just say a couple things to remember is there is no single acquirer out there that can serve you globally. They just, they do not exist. And then the uh, second thing is, you know, there's technology that wasn't available before um, that exists today that isn't necessarily provided by your acquirer. They're just tech companies that are out there, these disruptive companies up in San Francisco that are providing this technology to you. So, you know, we all start using stuff like that. We can uh, go do better things with our lives, right? Then integrate payments all the time. So thanks everyone. <laughs>